Oh, and um, sorry, real quick too. So we have the His Glory uh, booklet, and that's available at the front. And this is all the the glorious testimonies and the glorious messages from the ISBC last year. It has wonderful pictures, and our very own Pastor William, who gave a keynote message uh, as well uh, at the conference. So feel free to grab one of these at the front of the, the sanctuary. All right, so now we'll go to the passage. So here we go. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Okay, I'll begin. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zephora. And now Pastor William will give the message. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of our guests from across uh, North America and beyond. Thank you for joining us for Sunday worship service today. Um, let's uh, see here, get this started here. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me fix one quick thing real quick. Let me see here. Uh, screen mirroring, display settings, I gotta turn off something. Okay, perfect. All right, the title of this morning's message is Watered Their Flock. It comes from Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Our key verse is verse 17. Let's go ahead and read verse 17 together. Okay, let's go. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. As everyone knows, uh, this uh, last couple of days we had a North American staff conference. For, uh, I'm really surprised uh, how well today's passage dovetails with the North American Staff Conference topic. Now, you might be wondering, if you weren't at the Staff Conference, what in the world were people talking about at this secret Staff Conference meeting? <laughs> What's in this booklet that they were talking about? Well, I got to tell you that the prayer topic and the focus of the conference if you weren't at the conference, was actually you. The, tie, the, the main prayer topic that came from the, the staff conference is to raise spiritual leaders for the world. It was a leaders meeting to pray and to plan and to ask God for help to raise the next generation of spiritual leaders. So if you weren't at that meeting, you're the next generation of spiritual leaders that the conference was talking about. In today's passage, we see Moses. Moses, before he was a spiritual leader, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit worked powerfully in his life to open his eyes, to take the thing that he desired most in his soul and to transform it into a holy, pure desire that he could see God fulfill through his shepherd's life as a leader. So 
It's an amazing passage because I got to say, if, if you weren't at the staff conference, then this passage, this message is for you. So before we begin, let's go ahead and pray together. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we could see how your servant Moses really was led by you, by the work of the Holy Spirit, to become a shepherd for your people. He had a very passionate desire in his heart. He had a, he had a, a yearning in his soul, but only through serving you and only through becoming a shepherd was he able to really see it come to fruition in a proper way. Uh, please may you bless all of us to have a great faith that you understand our heart. You understand the, the desires of our soul so deep inside of us. And in your love, you want to bring that goodness out in a proper way, in a way that glorifies you and really blesses other people. So please help us to really see how you worked in Moses' life through this passage and bless us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So first, uh, I have five parts to this message. The first part is Moses' revolt. Good intentions, bad methods. Let's look at verses 11 to 12. Let's read uh, verses 11 and 12 responsibly. I'll go first. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. At this point in his life, Moses is about 40 years old. He lives to be about 120 years old, if I'm correct. And if you're to sort of change the, uh, the years to, say, somebody who lives about 90 years, you can say Moses is, in modern terms, about 30 years old. It says in verse 11, one day Moses had grown up. He went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian being a Hebrew, one of his people. At this time of Moses' life, his desires were changing. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, and he had focused on his uh, studies and his work and had really uh, grown as a disciplined man. But there was something stirring inside of him. It was the need to be connected to something much bigger than himself. So when he had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. The expression, his people, is repeated two times in verse 11 alone. It really shows that Moses was starting to look not inwardly at himself, but starting to look outward at a bigger purpose and a bigger meaning for his life. And he found it in his people. Verse 12, though, tells us that, um, that after seeing it, actually, in verse 11, we see that he saw an injustice happening. He saw an Egyptian... One of uh, his, maybe uh, of his, uh, one of the people the, of his time that he had grown up with. I don't know if he grew up with this person, but he was very familiar with the Egyptian way of life. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He saw an injustice. He saw not only this beating, but he saw, as it says, all of their burdens that, that Pharaoh had subjected to him. He was growing weary and burdened by all the burdens that he saw. And so when he saw an Egyptian being a Hebrew, it was a catalyst for him to finally snap and to take action. So in verse 12, he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and then did something very interesting and hid him in the sand. Moses had good intentions but his methods were very bad. As I was praying and preparing this message, I was, I was uh, surprised at how true it is that people that see injustices, who see bad things happening in this world, oftentimes end up becoming violent people. For example, a very famous guy, uh, uh, Che Guevara, I think that's how you say his name, this guy uh, is like the uh, icon uh, for young people uh, of rebellion and, and fighting for the people, right? You know, you find his, his uh, logo on all the shirts of uh, young people. <laughs> if you look into his background, there was some, like Moses, there was some moments that really sort of uh, formed uh, Che's uh, ideology and his, his way of life. For example, in Chile, 
Guevara was angered by the working conditions of the miners of Anaconda's copper mine. He saw people working in poor conditions. And then there was another time he was moved by an encounter with a persecuted communist couple who did not even own a blanket, describing them as shivering flesh and blood, victims of capitalist exploitation. And lastly, on the way to Machu Picchu, he was stunned by the crushing poverty of the remote rural areas where peasant farmers worked small plots of land owned by wealthy landlords. These injustices really made him want to become a revolutionary figure, to overthrow injustices and to right the wrongs of the world. The problem was is that Che, as he went about his revolution, ended up killing many, many people. We could say the same thing about um, uh, Karl Marx, Che, uh, Maximilian um, Robespierre of the French Revolution. Many revolutionary people who started off with good intentions ended up using really bad methods and bringing much death into this world. Che alone killed over 500 people in his life. And it's hard to even count the, the amount of people that died because of revolutions with good intentions but bad methods. Moses was on a track towards the same fate. He had a desire in his heart to do something good in this world. But the problem is he had no clue God's way of doing it. When he just did things based on his own flesh, he ended up killing another person. And not only that, killing them, but then hiding them in the sand. Hiding his actions, hiding his ways of, of doing things in the sand. Instead of being very proud and open and clear about what he was doing and why he was doing and what happened, instead of being able to give a testimony about how God worked, he had to hide his fruit in the sand. If you think about it, I don't mean to get uh, too uh, visual, but this is pretty visual. Imagine if you were walking by some uh, you know, heap of sand, and then you see a hand, a dead hand hanging out of the sand. And you go, what is that? And then you start to uncover it. And then there's a man uh, dead in the sand. In the dry sand is a dead man. Let's let that sink in. That was the fruit when Moses did things in his flesh, even though he had good intentions. We're going to contrast that a little bit later when we talk about Moses watering flocks. It's a much, much different uh, picture. But let's look at verse 2, So, uh, or not verse 2, let's look at uh, point 2, Moses' rejection, the, f the failure or the complete failure of good intentions. Let's look at verses 13 to 14. Let's read these two uh, responsibly. I'll go first. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? Yes, Another problem came up with Moses' good intentions. When he tried to reach out to his fellow Hebrews and inter intervene in a conflict, he, was, he found that he was completely ineffective at resolving and bringing peace in a conflict. Verse 13 says that when he went out the next day, you know, he probably walked out like really happy. Sun was shining and he thought, okay, I'm going to do some good today. And so when he went out the next day, behold, Two Hebrews were struggling together. They were fighting. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? Now, here I think is a uh, sign that Moses really didn't know how to help people. This question, why do you strike your companion? Think about that for a second. Moses shouldn't ask this question, why do you strike your companion? Moses should understand why people strike their companion. They strike their companion because of a lack of understanding who God is. They strike their companion because of lawlessness. They strike their companion because 
of a lack of understanding of God's love. But he says, why do you strike your companion as if this person was going to have the answer? Moses needed to have the answer. He also needed to understand that this is not a surprise. People need God in their life. And when people don't have God in their life, they have no other options but to sin and to strike their companion in many different ways, either verbally, physically, emotionally, hurting other people. And instead of loving their companion or loving their neighbor, they end up striking their companion. So Moses Why do you strike your companion shows that he didn't have an answer at this time. He didn't have training from God to be able to actually help people. And so verse 14 says, he answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Moses' cover was blown. Another interesting thing is that he was ineffective at helping these Hebrews, because he had a bad reputation. They said about him, do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? When they saw Moses, they didn't see a shepherd, a kind shepherd. Instead, what did they see? A killer. Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses needed to reveal Jesus' shepherd heart and his shepherd image. But at this time of his life, Moses couldn't help anybody because he had a killer's image and a murderer's reputation. And so also verse 14 says, he answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? This kind of reminds us of the people of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah when Lot tried to help help them or to help, help them to stop sinning. They said uh, something very similar to this. Who made you a, a judge over us? This shows that Moses at this time was still very proud so that people thought that he was judging them instead of help, truly helping them in, in real humility. So he didn't have a, uh, he still had a, a, a murderer's or killer's reputation and he didn't have a, a shepherd's image to really help people. So as a result, they rejected him even though he had good intentions to help his people. It says, then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. Like I mentioned earlier, he had something that he was hiding, and now it came out, and now he was very ashamed of it and realized that his influence was basically uh, blown and and, uh, had fizzled out. So let's look at the next section. He sat down by a well, finding God's way. Let's look at verses 15 to 17. I'll read, I'll read 15 first. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. So when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Because of his actions, Moses' life was now completely decimated. Think about it. He had spent 40 years or so uh, becoming a great man in Egypt. And overnight, because of his methods, because of his, his, his practices, he had basically destroyed his whole life in a, in a couple of days. So when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. So Moses had no other option but to flee. Now the graceful part here, gosh, this is so graceful because I need this grace a lot. Moses made a, uh, how would you say it, an amazing mistake. (laughs) But God used it. So important. God made a spectacular mistake. A spectacle mistake. Everyone knew about his mistake. (laughs) But God, in his love, used that mistake and led him in a new direction. Moses fled from Pharaoh. 
and stayed in the land of Midian. And here is a very important sentence. Let's say this next sentence together. You see it? It starts with and and ends with well. Okay, let's read it together. And he sat down by a well. And he sat down by a well. He had no life anymore. His good intentions but terrible methods had destroyed his own life. He is a broken man. He had to flee. There's some, there's some evidence uh, that he maybe even had a marriage to a Cushite woman at this time. And he had to leave his whole life behind because of his own failures. With his own hands, he had destroyed his life. How broken he felt at this time. He was a man on the run. He had nothing anymore. But once again, he sat down by a well in a cold at night and hot by day desert land with nothing except broken memories and conviction of his failures. He sat down by a well. He sat down by a well. He sat down by the place where God wanted him to be. A place where the thirsty find their thirst quenched. A place in the desert where water wells up to quench the thirst of those who come from distant places. He sat down by a well. How beautiful that he found a place because God brought him to a place where he could start over in a completely different and new way. Let's look at verse 16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. This well was not just a, um, an abandoned well. This well was a place where activity was happening, lots of activity. There wasn't just one or two people at this well at this time, but uh, there was seven daughters of a priest of Midian. If you look into it, it seems that this priest of Midian was related to uh, one of uh, Abraham's sons that he had after Isaac. I don't think he was a wicked priest or, or a strange priest. I think he was a priest who followed the living God and taught his seven daughters the right way as well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. These seven daughters were not worldly women. These seven daughters were not hoity-toity or high-maintenance. These seven daughters were hard-working shepherdesses who worked to not satisfy their own sinful flesh, but spent day after day learning to put smelly, but so cute, sheep in front of themselves. They were shepherdesses. They were a shepherd family. And the priest of Midian had raised his daughters to live at, uh, in the desert, but to serve a flock from this well that they drew water from and filled their troughs to water their flocks with. You know, I really like this image of a well in a desert. It really reminds us of the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is not limited by circumstances. The work of the Holy Spirit does not need to have anything around it because the work of the Holy Spirit is itself life. And from this well in the desert, the seven daughters filled the troughs with water and watered their father's flock. But something bad happened when they did that. Verse 17, the shepherds, they were good shepherdesses, but there were also bad shepherds around. <laughs> bad shepherds. You know, just imagine, if, if you can, all the scripture that you've read talk about the bad shepherds. There's lots of bad shepherds in the Bible. 
And verse 17, there's some too. The shepherds came and drove them away. These shepherds were oppressors, just like the Egyptian was an oppressor for the Hebrews. So these bad shepherds were oppressors. And they drove them away. Those kind-hearted seven daughters of the priest of Midian who filled water troughs for their father's flock were driven away by the injustice of these shepherds. Now here's the beautiful part. This is so beautiful. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. In the first part of the passage, Moses was a complete failure to help people. But in the context of this well, in the context of where God had brought him, his desire to help people, his desire inside of him, deep in his soul, to rectify injustices was allowed to flourish. He stood up and saved the seven daughters of the uh, priest of Midian, and then he saved them, and then he watered their flock. He saved them. Here we can see that there's an important concept uh, being revealed. Moses, because of uh, God's uh, work in his life, was traveling from, he had traveled from the world of rulers, where the arm of flesh rules the day and things are done in the way of the way, uh, is done in the way of rulers but now he transitioned to a world of shepherds where things are done by the way of the well the way of shepherding and in that new world the world of shepherds Moses's desire to help and to rectify injustices was able to flourish. It's a beautiful story. I can speak uh, for myself in the sense that um, I was not not like Moses. (laughs) I did not see injustices in life and want to change the world. In fact, I was very focused on myself uh, and very content with it. But I can say one thing. I hope this makes sense. Deep in my soul, I really wanted to do something important with my life. I wanted to do something that's of real quality with my life. You know, if you talk to my kids or, or my wife, they'll tell you that their dad and their, or their husband uh, loves quality work. You know, in, in the past, I really... Uh, liked Apple computers and Steve Jobs because it was always quality computers, quality software. Even before becoming a Christian, I was well aware of Steve Jobs and and how he was such a ruthless manager over people to drive quality. And I liked quality so much, I thought to myself, oh, I'll be like Steve Jobs when I grow up and really make sure the quality gets done really well. You know, but there's a funny thing that the Bible teaches, and I love this. Love does not insist on its own way. And I found that I could actually fulfill the yearning and deep longing of my soul to do something of quality with my life. But not in, through the arm of flesh, but through the way of shepherding, the way that Jesus shows at the way of the well is a lot different than the way of the world. And so this, but this is really the key point of today's passage that I wanna just uh, hit. God did not call us to just transform us into something that we're not gonna like. We're going to like, we're going to love the person that Jesus is transforming us into. But when we get called, when we move from one world to the next, it can cause a lot of anxiety. What is this life of following Jesus? Where is it going to (laughs) end? What's it going to be like? You know, when uh, at the uh, at the conference, um, uh, a great servant of God, Liz Hembikidis, shared that 
she received some questions about what it's like to be married to a, a, a full-time servant of God. And the top question that she got was, what, it, what is your salary like? <laughs> and that reminded me of the fear and the anxiety that, that can come with making it, that can come with following Jesus. But I'm here to say, look at this passage. Moses wanted to help people in his life, but he couldn't do it. But when he came to this well, when God brought him and had him sat, sat, sit down at a well in this new life, his, the longing of his soul was fulfilled. Part four, let's look at uh, their father, Raul, God's friend. Let's look at verses 18 uh, to 20. Okay, let's read these back and forth. When they came home to their father, Raul, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. So I love this. Uh, I, you know, I got to tell you, I was very confused. Like, why is this in the Bible exactly? <laughs> But I think uh, I got some insight, especially from the staff conference. When they came home to their father, Raul, he said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? So Raul, his name uh, in other places is Jethro, but here's Raul. Raul means in Hebrew, friend, God's friend or friend of God. God's friend. He was the priest of Midian, but he was God's friend. And as God's friend, he had matured as a servant of God, and he was very uh, conscientious about the flock, his seven daughters, who were put under his care. And so when they came home early, he wasn't, uh, you know, watching uh, YouTube or uh, <laughs> playing Call of Duty uh, or some other weird thing that uh, a man can get sidetracked by, but he noticed that his daughters came home early. So he asked them, how is it that you have come home so soon today? And then verse 19, his daughters, they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. So that's pretty straightforward. And then verse 20, he said to his daughters, then where is he? If he did this great thing for you, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Here we see that uh, Raul, uh, their father, understood that such a kind gesture should not be uh, looked past. And so he said to his daughters, who were a little bit naive, a little bit less sensitive, that they, that they should have brought, their, brought the Moses to them so that he could have uh, bread to eat. I think uh, what, I see, what I saw here was the importance of generations of servants of God. So I made this illustration because Raul, or uh, Jethro, was a priest of Midian, and he was passing on his spiritual insight and sensitivity to his daughters. And Moses, who was a newcomer, was kind of like the new generation. And in a lot of ways, I'm sure that as time went forward, that Moses learned a lot from the um, daughters of Jethro and also from Jethro himself. So when we look at these verses here, we can see that first, his daughters needed to keep growing. They needed to understand that they still had an area to grow in, in shepherding. They left their uh, sheep. <laughs> they brought their physical sheep, but they left their spiritual sheep at the well. <laughs> it's not easy to grow as a shepherd or shepherdess for other people. It's so easy to be self-focused. I like to, one of my favorite stories to t talk about how God changed me was when I first did my first one-to-one -one Bible study when I was 19 years old, almost 20, and I literally had physical pain waiting for my Bible student, my first Bible student for my first Bible study. 
because for the first time I was doing something for somebody else and somehow my body was like crying or like violently uh, re uh, not liking it. It was very odd. <laughs> I was so accustomed to serving myself, so unaccustomed to serving other people that my body wasn't used to it. Very odd. I'm going to ask the Lord Jesus what was going on there. <laughs> but I think another thing that we see here in, in uh, Raul or Jethro was that he saw potential in somebody like Moses. This is so beautiful, too. You know, Moses was an Egyptian, and he was, you know, this, uh, you know, he was homeless. <laughs> But when he heard the story, uh, as it says in, um, uh, as it said in the in the previous verses, when he, uh, sorry, verse nineteen, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and even drew water for us and watered the flock. When when uh, Raul heard that story, he, I'm I'm convinced he saw some possibility in Moses. You know, at another staff conference story that really uh, w left an impression on me was Teddy Hebekidis. Um, I hope I'm saying his last name right. It's a little tongue twister for me. But um, he talked about how one of his Bible students was a uh, Bible student by day and a gang banger by night. <laughs> and that he knew that his Bible student carried a gun and, uh, you know, one day after uh, having Bible study, uh, according to the story, I'm kind of like retelling it, but he went outside with his Bible student after Bible study, and his Bible student, what? A heated Bible study. A heated Bible study. Oh, thank you. Yes, a very heated Bible study <laughs> where the Word of God and, and this uh, young man was uh, possibly in conflict. And, and the, Teddy was surprised that his Bible student pulled out a gun, pulled out his gun. Teddy said that he was uh, worried uh, what was going to happen to him. Was he going to have to, uh, what would happen to his wife, Liz, if, <laughs> if he died? But then to his surprise, his Bible student took the gun and put it into the sewer drain and said, I'm throwing this away for Jesus. One of the most important things about being a shepherd that we see in a mature servant like Raul is the possibility the possibility not only that's or the potential that's in a person, but also the power of God to transform a person. You know, the, the shepherdesses, the seven daughters, they just left Moses there. But Raul, when he heard of, heard of him, he said, go, get him and bring him. Call him that, we may, that he may eat bread. So let's look at the, the fifth point. Um, Moses was content, uh, peace in a foreign land. Let's read the last two verses to, uh, together. Okay, let's go. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. I love this. Moses was content to dwell with the man. Moses was content to dwell with the man. Moses had seen a lot of great things in his uh, past life, in his past years. He had done a lot of great things. But now he, uh, there was uh, nothing really going on except for really just the flock and the well. Watering the sheep, taking the sheep around. But Moses was not too good for that life. He was not longing or looking around the corner for something better. He wasn't easily going to be pulled out of this life, this new life of, of serving God in, in this area where he was at. And it says, and Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. You know, I think Zipporah is an interesting uh, character in the Bible. Her name means bird. 
which reminds me of the, the, the dove of the Holy Spirit. Because in a lot of ways, she really is a very important person in Moses' life. Let me show you real quick. You know, Moses, he started off in Egypt for 40 years. Then he spent 40 years in the, in the desert as a shepherd. And then after that 40 years, then he became the man of God. But Zipporah was there when he made his transition from an Egyptian prince of Egypt type to a shepherd. And Zipporah, we just studied this uh, on Wednesday night, Zipporah was there to help with Moses make the transition from a um, shepherd into a leader, and especially she was instrumental in keeping him from being killed and uh, with the circumcision of their son. So not only did God provide a new life, but he also provided a wonderful woman of God, the daughter of the priest of Midian, Zipporah, to help him in critical moments of his life and to be there with him. She was really an instrument of the Holy Spirit in his life. Verse 22 says, She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. This is the conclusion. I think it's an important conclusion to this passage. I, wanna, um, I like how the NIV puts it. The NIV says, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Um, everyone's heard of Google Translate, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Simple, yes. Well, I came up with a new piece of software. Uh, I call it Spiritual Translate. Okay, so I'm gonna type in, uh, I'm gonna type in here, uh, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land, all right? And then I'm gonna hit enter, okay. So what does Moses mean here? I have become a foreigner of a foreign land. My past experiences don't help in this new life. I feel like I'm relearning everything. I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. My past experiences don't help in this new life. I feel like I'm relearning everything. This is the life at the well. The life at the well, the things of the past don't work in the shepherd's life. The shepherd's life is a humble life. It's a life where we focus on others instead of ourselves. But the interesting thing is about this life is that everything that was up is down, and everything that's down is then up. For instance, in the world, if you feel thirsty, if you feel hungry, if you feel in want, you take care of yourself. And if your neighbor is thirsty or hungry, you let them worry about themselves. And after taking care of myself, if there's something left over, maybe I'll help them. But they should actually take care of themselves anyways. <laughs> but life at the well is different. The life at the well says that those who refresh others will be refreshed. Those who refresh others will be refreshed. Interesting thing happened when I became a Bible teacher. This foreign concept hit me like a, I don't know, like a, like a ton of bricks. When I gave God's word to another person, when I, because I didn't feel like it, but decided to go and serve a Bible study and help somebody else to know Jesus, I found that the wellspring of water from the Holy Spirit was flowing and rising up within me. When I came to the Bible study and met my Bible study, and oftentimes I was like, oh, hey, good to see you. Let's go. <laughs> they were thirsty and I was thirsty. <laughs> but when we sat down across from each other for one-to-one -one Bible study and opened up God's word, the water from the well started coming, rising up inside of me, 
quenching my thirst. And as I then shared what God was giving me, even uh, in the moment and not on, even on the Bible study notes, I saw across the table from me another person, a thirsty sheep, tasting water, oftentimes for the very first time in their life. I found that what was up was now down, and what was down was now up. I had become a foreigner in a foreign land. I had to, I had to and I am still, <laughs> I don't want to uh, you know, get it wrong, I still am learning, relearning everything. But I have to say that from this passage, I want to encourage every young person here that you should have great faith in God. Trust God. He knows the desire of your soul. He knows the deep needs and wants of your soul. He knew Moses's. And by coming to this new life, to this foreign life in a foreign land, you will find your thirst is being quenched through the life at the well, through the shepherd's life of putting others first. So let's conclude um, by uh, reading the key verse. Let's read verse 17 together. Okay, let's go. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we could um, see how you saw Moses. You knew his heart. You knew his soul. And you really wanted to uh, give him and help him to fulfill the desires of his heart. But it wasn't going to be through the Egyptian way. It was going to be through the way of uh, the well, the way of being a shepherd for your people. Uh, and so thank you so much for all of the um, uh, people that are growing and, and all of us who, um, who have uh, come to know this way. Help us to keep persevering in this way to the very end. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.